Okay, so I famously don't like leaving my house to do journalism, but I figured that given this is to do with the area I live in, I might as well go outside. I'm on Nobby's Beach because that's where you film things when you're in Newcastle. But I'm also here because last year the federal government gave the green light to a wind turbine zone to be built 42 kilometres off the coast of Newcastle. Now, what's that going to look like? Well, I've got my comically large telescope here in order to uh, look through it and uh, with a bit of CGI we can sort of look at what that might look like. Ah, something red. All I can see is red. Ah, I know what that red thing is, it's a coal ship. See, for the last 200 years or so, there has been an almost permanent queue of coal ships waiting off the coast of Newcastle to come into the harbour over there to be loaded with coal. Off the Newcastle coast, this foreign coal ship is ready and waiting to load. I've lived in Newcastle for most of my life and I've never really heard anyone complaining about the coal ships. And yet last year, more than 2,000 submissions were sent in, mostly complaining about the prospect of these turbines 42 kilometres off the coast. I'm very uh, you know, concerned about anything that affects our natural environment, and that's got me involved in this turbine issue. People in Newcastle are used to industry. You come just sort of an hour up the road, and up here our main industry is tourism. And it's eco-based tourism, marine tourism. And it's not just Newcastle. People around the country and around the world don't like them. Donald Trump is one of the people who doesn't like them. He says they kill birds. And of course it's like a graveyard for birds. He says that they kill whales. They're driving the whales, I think, a little batty. He says that they affect property values. If you have a windmill anywhere near your house, congratulations, your house just went down 75% in value. And he says that they create more pollution than they prevent. Tremendous fumes, gases are spewing into the atmosphere. So the big question is, are any of these claims about wind turbines true? I'm Matt Bevan, and this is If You Listen. The wind energy debate has been going on for decades, all over the world, but it's played out in miniature on a single Australian island, where a massive wind project threatened to tear the community apart. Oh, Jesus! Come on, start, you bastard! Start! Come on, Dougie! Come on, Doug! I love this piece of archival tape. In 1980, an ABC camera crew rocked up to King Island and asked this farmer if they could film him swearing at his diesel electric generator and he was like, let me grab the crank. For many Australians, this is an intrinsic part of country life. The diesel generator that provides electricity for those who live beyond the reach of the town power supply. King Island is pretty much exactly halfway between Tasmania and the Australian mainland. It was uninhabited when Europeans colonised the country and most people who visited King Island did so involuntarily when their ships were wrecked there by the Roaring Forties winds. Other people went there on purpose to beat seals to death with clubs. Eventually cattle farming was established and a mining industry. King Island has one of the world's biggest shelite mines. Nearby at Narra Cooper, another million dollar venture, beach mining for Rutile and Zircon. Shelite Rutile and Zircon. I think that at least one of those words has to be made up. The island's population reached 2,500, big enough for a local horse racing club with a single bookie named Pat. Pat, uh, the only bookie on the island, yes. it, it sounds like a capitalist dream, is it really? Not really, no, no. And a highly competitive footy league with three teams, Grassy, North and Curry. <laughs> The island wasn't connected to the mainland or Tasmanian electricity grids. It had a tiny diesel power station, but most farmers had to rely on generators like Doug. Come on, Dougie. Come on, Doug. He calls his generator Doug after the Tasmanian oh. Premier, Doug Lowe, whom he blames, perhaps unfairly, for his power oh, problems. Although there was one very smug chap on King Island who never had to wrestle with a generator or pay exorbitant prices to import diesel from the mainland. Jeff Dodge. He set up his own windmill. 
Jeff Dodge has had this windmill in King Island for three and a half years. In that time, he's never been without power. His total running cost has been $3.60 for lubricating oil. The wind comes free. The turbine was charging a bank of batteries for any time the wind wasn't blowing. Jeff seemed pretty happy with his setup. I mean, let's face it, what else have we got plenty of here? Wind and rain. That's right, and that's just what it's doing now. So imagine, King Island, a tiny isolated community run off diesel, and Jeff Dodge with his smug smile and one lonely wind turbine. But there were plans brewing for more. But first, let's zoom out. Let's look at the rest of the country. Remote properties in Australia had been generating electricity from wind for decades, using products like the Hannon's Freelight 32 volt wind driven lighting plant. But they only generated enough power for a few light bulbs and a radio, and only when the wind was blowing. There were still no major wind turbines connected to the power grid. Why? Wind had a bad reputation. People thought that renewable energy was a hippie, weirdo, inner-city European thing. We have to show people that alternative renewable energy resources are not a myth. It seemed like everyone pushing it had wild hair, voluptuous beards and a dislike for capitalism. The wind is free, it just sits there. Anybody can use it, nobody can control it. And this bothers big business. One of Australia's first wind turbine manufacturers, Rob Clark, felt it was very important to make it clear that he was not a hippie weirdo. He describes himself as being not even pale green. I mean, Look at this guy. He looks like he should be selling encyclopedias door to door. He said he was only in the business because someone bullied him into it. I had a friend who was involved in uh, alternate energy and, and alternate uh, lifestyles. Alternate lifestyles, you say? He used to abuse me continually about uh, uh, being a purveyor of evil in, in society. Rob Clark was trying to build cost-effective, highly efficient wind turbines. Just how good are they? Well, uh, being modest, I suppose, I think they're the best in the world. And yet... He's received almost no government assistance. Also, while it was free to run, it was expensive to set up these turbines in the first place. Right up to the end of the 20th century, politicians were playing down wind power's potential and implying it was something that only greenies were interested in. I don't think we should get carried away with the belief that uh, wind power is a substitute, a total substitute for the next energy source that Tasmania needs. Okay, back to King Island, a community with a lack of power and a declining population. After the shutdown of a number of key industries, which had closed down in part because the island's energy costs were too high, there was a lack of jobs. Well, about a decade ago, in the mid-2010s, King Island became a focal point of national debate about wind power. The Tasmanian government started by building enough wind turbines to run King Island's power grid on its own. A world first. This month, wind turbines produced enough energy to switch off the island's backup diesel generators for 90 minutes. It's the first time that a 100% renewable energy power system has been achieved at this scale. But then the government had a much bigger and much more controversial idea a $2 billion plan to power a quarter of a million mainland homes using turbines on King Island and a high voltage undersea cable. With 200 giant wind turbines, each 150 metres high from the base to the blade tip, the largest wind farm in the southern hemisphere. The turbines would cover up to 15% of the island. Now, while many locals saw this as an opportunity, others became angrier than a guy trying to start a dodgy generator. I think the wind farms are a great idea for the island. I'm against. Don't want any wind farms here to... Uh, they're just ugly, horrible things. So we'll keep a few wind turbines to power our own island, but we're not going to cover the island in them just to help the bloody mainlanders. After being surprised by the level of opposition, the power company decided that they would put it to a vote should they push forward with the project or not. I don't want them. Personally, I'd be highly embarrassed if our community doesn't look at this opportunity. That's pretty easy. Yeah. No, yeah. no, it's a wind farm. Thanks, Big Dog. The island's mayor said it caused deep division in the community. It hasn't been a pleasant place to live, I suppose. Yeah. Likely. The division split through some families. It will destroy the island. It will, it will rip the heart out of the community. It'll split, the, it'll divide the community. It's, it's happened, it's happening already. 
This local named Michael said he couldn't understand why his father supported the proposal. He's doing it for the grandkids and, 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 and other, you know, the future grandkids on the island. Well, none of his family want it. Local farmers were supportive, particularly of the rent that they would get from having towers on their land. Others were excited about the fast internet they would get through the undersea cable to the mainland. But local tourism operators were not on board. They mounted a big, expensive PR campaign against the project with funding from, well, somewhere. No, I'm not going to tell you how much, nor who's paying for it. Why is that? I don't plan to. <laughs> it's none of your business. The campaign focused on basically the same issues that all anti-wind farm campaigns focus on. Same issues that Donald Trump talks about. Health concerns from the turbines, threats to wildlife, threats to livestock, the pollution created by construction, property prices. And the campaign worked. While 58% of King Islanders voted in favour of proceeding with the Taswin project, the opposition in the community was big enough, combined with the Abbott government's decision to abolish various green energy incentives, to kill it. King Island does still have a few wind turbines, but it needs to burn diesel as a backup. It still has no fast internet connection and gets no financial benefit at all from the constant howling wind. No. Now, what I'm going to do now is a little bit unfair. I'm going to look at these concerns from 2013 with the added benefit of an extra 11 years of scientific research. Let's start with animals. On King Island, the big concern is birds. Well, they might be helping to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but wind farms may also prove a death sentence for one of Australia's most threatened birds. That bird lives part of the year on King Island. The orange-bellied parrot migrates to King Island. The orange-bellied parrot has unknowingly been the arch nemesis of wind farms in Tasmania and Victoria for decades now. Concerns about the critically endangered parrot held up the Bald Hills wind farm in Victoria for years. There may be fewer than a hundred of them alive in the wild. Now, there's no doubt that turbine blades do kill birds and bats. They don't come out of the sky like the cricket balls. I do hope the bats appreciate the irony of being compared to balls, but here's the thing. The most efficient and widespread killers of wildlife live in our laps, our backyards, and in every national park in every state. A US Fish and Wildlife Service study estimated that America's domestic cat population kills more birds every hour than wind turbines do in a year. It's estimated the average domestic pet eats 32 animals a year, and feral cats, 700. Even the most determined bird-hating wind turbines can only dream of donking that many birds. That being said, in areas with endangered species, turbine operators had to take extra precautions to decrease their turbines' donkitude, their donkosity, their donkmentum. When it comes to offshore wind turbines, the concern is whales. Well, cetaceans, really. Whales, dolphins, and other things that breathe air but live underwater like absolute clowns. Despite a lot of research, there's no evidence at all that whales and dolphins are affected by the sound made by wind turbines. And like, think about it. Even if wind turbines made this noise, which I should note they do not, they make it above the waterline. And under the water, it's already extremely noisy. There are ships and recreational boats, underwater vessels and machines that go ping. We bounce sounds around to look for ships and map the ocean floor. And there's mining, drilling and even explosions. There's also no evidence that they cause any problems for human health. Windmills have been used on farms close to animals and people without incident for literally hundreds of years. Okay, so what about the pollution involved in construction? The world is tiny compared to the universe. So tremendous, tremendous amount of fumes and everything. Whether it's in China, Germany, it's going into the air, it's our air, their air, everything. What he's saying is that wind turbines involve a lot of steel, aluminium, and concrete, and all of those create emissions, not to mention the cost of transportation and the fact that you have to dispose of the blades once they reach the end of their life. All of that is true, but when you compare it to the alternatives, wind is the least environmentally damaging type of energy. It's better even than solar. Okay, what about house prices? There have been multiple studies done, mostly in the United States, on the effect of wind turbines on the value of houses. Taken together, 
The studies indicate that the announcement of a wind turbine being built within a mile of your home, which can be seen from your house, can decrease the value of your property by around 10%. 10 years after the installation of the turbines, the value returns to what's expected. And if the turbine is more than two miles away, there's no effect at all. The only verifiable issue with wind turbines, really, is that people don't like them. People don't like having them nearby or having them on their land. Of course, that means that they are now increasingly being built in native bushland, which threatens to destroy habitats of endangered species. But opposition to wind farms remains strong, including here in Newcastle. Vocal community opposition has taken the industry and the federal government by surprise. Concerns vary from visual impacts to what the turbines might mean for whales migrating down the coast. Infrastructure is often ugly and annoying, but so are open cut coal mines, coal ports and coal carrying heavy rail lines and we sure have a lot of those in Newcastle. As we sweep aside the dark satanic mills of the past, something has to replace them. And these things aren't just papering over the cracks, they are generating serious power. The Newcastle offshore wind farm is predicted to generate more power than the region's two largest coal-fired power stations combined. They're not a threat, people just don't like them. But they have to go somewhere.